Not only do medical journals guide current practice, they shape the trajectory of modern medicine. With this great responsibility, how can journals and researchers make sure that their work is not only reproducible, but also meaningful? Today, we're sitting down with Dr. Jeffrey Drazen, the editor-in-chief of one of the world's most prestigious medical journals, the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Drazen has led the continued growth of the NEJM since 2000. All right, let's hear Dr. Drazen's take on this. Thank you so much for joining us on Dot Thoughts, Dr. Drazen. Huh? No problem. Where do you think the future of scientific journals is headed? So uh, we're in an in information source. And one of the things that journals have done and will continue to do, I hope, uh, is to take a look at research that's published from a dispassionate point of view. Any, anybody that's a successful researcher is really passionate about his or her work. You know, they think about it day and night, and they're really into it, and they see all sorts of ways that their research could change the world which is terrific, but when it comes down to actually making a statement about what you've actually learned and how that information can be used, you have to be very conservative. Uh, because we've learned time and time again that when you overguess or you overplan or you over uh, overcommit, it's hard to live up to those commitments. So uh, we hope that editors will continue to hold authors' feet to the fire, to make sure that their work, what they're claiming, can be claimed. And one of the most interesting things that we found is that uh, people thank us for it. You know, they worked on these papers and they send them in, and we're the first people to read them really seriously. You know, we're going through them line by line saying, you know, you can say that, you can, maybe you can say this, but you can't say that. Uh, and we're, gi we're giving them the uh, intellectual challenge that they want. They know it's going to come again when their articles are published, but up front, that's our job. Um, now, we tell a lot of people no. We publish about two and a half percent of what comes in, uh, and that's because we limit what we publish. You know, people say, you know, back when you were paper, pu publishing a paper magazine, you had to limit it. But now you can publish as much as you want. And I say, that's exactly what you can't do. How would you like to have hundreds of new articles show up at your doorstep every week or every day? Right? It happens already, right? It's too much. You can't handle it. So when you buy a subscription to a journal like ours, you're paying us. And that money, whether it comes from your pocket or your university or your hospital's pocket, pays our salaries, and we pick out of the 6,000 things that come in, 200 that we think might be of interest to you. So we're doing that work. Uh, and that's one of the jobs that, that journals should do is they should be selective. What steps can researchers take to ensure that their work is not only reproducible, as you said, but also meaningful? So uh, the reproducible part, I think, is easy. Uh, if you're working in basic science, and you're, you're you think you've discovered some new idea, some new thing, uh, get somebody else in your lab to run your protocol and do your experiment. Um, to, because it's possible that you've made a mistake, you, that there's an error, and that you're really studying an artifact. And so as a lab director, when we have some new finding that we think is like really important, I make sure somebody else can reproduce it. Not that I think that the person who's doing it is any malfeasance, but the most common thing is that they screw something up. Uh, don't quit because you have the answer you want. Quit because you have the answer you know is right. Nothing was is more important than getting it right because uh, as a researcher, the thing that keeps you going is that every once in a while you discover something or you understand something you didn't understand before and suddenly all sorts of things that didn't make sense fit together. It's like in a mystery story at the end. I understand it, at least for a while, before the new questions pop up. But getting it right is really important. And something happened around 2000 where the goal became publishing papers, not getting it right. And... Uh, you know, the criteria for promotion was where your work was published, not whether your w work was reproducible or not. And so we have to change our mindset. You know, 
Publishing in the New England Journal, publishing in Nature, publishing in Science shouldn't be it. It's publishing something that's right, that changes your field, that other people can use. That is what should be the goal. And we are trying to encourage people to do that. Getting it right is what counts. So that's part about you know the, the reproducibility part. And then I think people should try to work on things that they think are important. Now, if you think something's important and work really hard on it, and you think it's going to make a difference to your field, that's the work that you want to do. Um, something that you're interested in doing. You don't want to do something that, they, that you're not interested in, but the rest of the world is, because you're not going to like it. So it's a really hard game, so at least you should enjoy playing it. Uh, and you know, one of the things that people, mistakes that people make all the time, I think, is they go into an area because they think it's hot. Now, you want to go into an area because you think it's going to illuminate your problem. You're, you pick a big problem to study. I studied asthma, and I still am interested in asthma, for 35 years. The questions evolve. The te- we have new technologies. How can I understand more about this than I knew 10 years ago? And how could I use the latest technology to advance my understanding? And so you stick with something that you think is a, an important problem. Because there are very few things that we understand in such detail that there isn't any room for improvement. What are best practices for physicians and medical students looking to integrate new research findings into their daily practice? Well, so you have to read and keep up with what's new. You have to be reasonably skeptical, I think. Uh, but you have to be prepared to change. In my uh, tenure at the journal, I've been there uh, 18 years, uh, there are probably a dozen things that when we publish them the next day, you'd be a fool not to do them. They were, the data were so strong and so convincing, and there were lives at stake, that it, it makes a difference. Uh, we published an article in 2000 about using low tidal volume ventilation in the ICU. I'm an ICU guy in addition to being interested in asthma. And it was sort of skeptical. People were skeptical about it at the beginning. Uh, but um, after five or six years, everybody started doing it. And that simple maneuver has saved more ICU lives than everything else that we've done put together. So. Uh, I say, when you see new stuff, does it make sense? Does it, does it fit together? And if it doesn't, the people who, who did it, they should say, we well, know this didn't make sense, and that's why we did X, Y, and Z to prove it's true. But uh, you shouldn't adopt blindly what's new, but you'd be a fool to stick with what you were doing for the last 20 years. But what won't be wrong uh, is understanding and empathizing with the patients. Um, and when you see disease over and over again, uh, you know, we see things now that I couldn't treat um, when I was an intern. You know, when somebody came in with a heart attack in um, 1972, you just made sure they didn't die of VF. That was it. You know, you put them at bed rest, and we probably gave a lot of people pulmonary emboli. Now you come in with a heart attack, you're in the cath lab. You know, the open artery hypothesis, and we had something we could do about it. There are still docs out there who are treating heart attacks the old-fashioned way, and they aren't helping their patients. So medicine's changing. What you should be learning in medical school isn't actually the knowledge. You should be learning how to keep yourself up to date because it's a continuously changing field, you know. Um, and what we want what we as the world wants, is that when you go to a doctor, you want he or she to not necessarily be the late, had the latest, but be close enough to what's up so that you're not getting second-class treatment.